Okay, so welcome today to uh, a conversation uh, that I'm having with Dr. Ashley Morgan uh, about uh, whales on screen. So my name is Dr. Michael Samuel and I'm a visiting lecturer here at the Department of Film and Television at the University of Warwick. So here at Warwick over the last few years, I've convened a module called Television History and Criticism. And over the last two years, I've introduced a workshop session around whales on screen. After an introduction to Welsh art, poetry, politics, and a whistle-stop tour of Wales on screen, I give students, and there's predominantly English students, uh, the challenge of locating the Welsh character in, in a selection of television programmes. And often the result, by no fault of their own, is commonly a character of South Walian um, or a tourist advert for our national parks or our beaches. Now, an issue I've sort of had personally is a, quite a problematic connection with my sense of national identity and heritage, and especially a tense relationship with representations of Wales and of Welsh identity on screen. So these workshops with my students have often emphasised this anguish as opposed to helping me overcome it. So living in teaching, uh, living and um, teaching in England over the last few years, I'm feeling particular longing for Wales, uh, as we, we use the word to describe the sort of homesickness. Um, and equally a confusion of where to find it or where to begin to look for it. So I thought no better way really to explore some of these tensions than with a fellow uh, Welsh scholar who's dedicated their career to explorations of identity of gender, of masculinity in popular culture, and particularly Welsh identity and, and Welsh masculinity, than Dr. Ashley Morgan. So Dr. Ashley Morgan is a senior lecturer in the School of Art and Design at Cardiff Metropolitan University. Her current research interests are masculinity, sex, representations of the male body, and especially but not limited to representations of masculinity in popular culture. Ashley has published on male, Greek, um, male geek identity, sorry, <laughs> um, sexual aestheticism in, uh, as a viable form of male sexual behavior and the presence of mediated toxic uh, masculinity. She's especially interested in the intersections between masculine identity and clothing and has published on men in skirts and the relationship between hegemonic masculinity and, men in, and men's suits. Her book chapter, Sherlock Holmes and the Case for Toxic Masculinity, which I love the title of, um, examines Sherlock Holmes as the, the provenance of discursive toxic masculinity in popular culture for the forthcoming Routledge International Handbook of Communication and Gender, which will be published at the end of this month, the 30th of November. And her paper on hybrid masculinity in music, from emo kid to stylish GK gent and back again, Matt Healy, and hybrid masculinity will be published in the double edition of Critical Studies in Men's Fashion, December 2020. And Ashley is currently preparing a book proposal on Welsh masculinity for Routledge. So a very busy time for Ashley. So I'm really grateful uh, that she could make the time to today to have this discussion with me. Um, so Boradar, Ashley, uh, welcome. Welcome to the conversation. Hi, Mike. Thank you for having me. So, um, as, as we've sort of chatted in, in sort of preparation for today, I have a sort of font of questions that I really want to to work through. And this is to navigate my own relationship with with Welsh identity and my sort of own connection to Welsh sort of heritage. Um, but I'm also conscious this is not just about me. This is not just a sort of a national identity therapy session. Um, and it's really intended as a sort of a, a resource then, or something for our students to refer to a sense of how we as uh, as Welsh people, as Welsh scholars, connect to our own identity on screen or, or fail to connect, perhaps. Um, so for the course of this conversation, I'm sort of limited those questions down to three. Um, and that is, I'm really interested in hearing what, uh, what is your relationship to Wales and Welshness on uh, Wales and Welshness? Secondly, what role does heritage play in identity formation? And then thirdly, I want us to interrogate the screen. So what is your relationship to Wales and Welshness on screen? So I think we're going to start um, with those sort of those first sort of set of questions. And that is, what is your relationship? What is your relationship to to Wales and to Welshness? I thought it'd be a good point 
just for you to maybe provide a personal introduction to your to yourself. You bit, just provide us with a bit a snapshot of your background, and then we'll go. Um, a hi. Further. Yes. Okay. Um. So I have lived in Wales for twenty years. Uh. But I haven't always worked in Wales. Um, I'm from a place called Portorbet originally, which is a big industrial town. And I left when I was about 20 and, and I didn't really come back for a long time. I had all my education in England, in the north of England particularly. And I, and I always thought I would settle in the north of England, particularly in Yorkshire, because it had a really good feeling to it. But I slightly missed um, one of the things about being a Welsh person living elsewhere is that your Welshness is always highly amplified, particularly in, in the way you speak. Um, and I would often have that, particularly when I lived in places like Sheffield, people would say, oh, you're not from around here, duck, are you? And uh, and I'd be like, no. And and then they sort of start to tell you about Welsh people that they knew and, and that kind of thing. So you kind of, even when you're somewhere else, you're never far away from either somebody who is Welsh or the country itself. And um, I noticed that when I travelled as well, where somebody, suddenly a Welsh person pops up and they know somebody you know, but you're in California or, you know, Vancouver or something like that. Um, I have quite a paradoxical relationship with being Welsh. Um, and and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, I, I, I've only really worked here for about the past 13 years. Before then, I was working all over the country and particularly in London. And again, my sort of Welshness was, it was always something that perhaps students would point out. Again, this idea of, oh, you know, you're not local, you're, you're not local to London, for example, and, you know, we don't understand the accent, who's that, what, you know, where exactly are you from? And and then this idea that you're from some sort of strange bucolic field where all Welsh people live, it, where they're just sort of rolling hills and countryside and, and that kind of thing. And being somebody from Port Albert, I, I always used to find that a bit ironic, really, because growing up in Port Albert was an incredibly grey experience, even when the sun shone, it was fairly grey. Um, and, you know, all the stereotypes about whales and raining are actually fairly true, but perhaps a bit less the stereotypes of our relationship with sheep. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I have a bit of a love, as you know, Mike, because you and I have spoken about this quite a bit. I've got a bit of a love hate relationship with Wales because fundamentally um, Welsh women are very poorly represented. Nobody really cares what Welsh women think or who they are or what what they do, because I find very much that um, Welsh culture is highly dominated by men. And that's what start, got me thinking about researching into masculinity and Welsh masculinity, because like Kimberly Crenshaw, the uh, American philosopher, says the image of the citizen is male. And I think that's particularly pertinent in Wales. Um, although people talk about, you know, advances with women and in, particularly in terms of sport in Wales, quite a lot of. Welsh uh, sporting women are fan doing fantastically. Um, fundamentally, when you think of Welsh people, you think of Welsh men, because that's really what there is. And there's this interesting schism, I think, between men and women in Wales, but also the way in which men are represented is really interesting to me, because men are either lyrical actors, they're Michael Sheen, they're very clever, they're Richard Burton with his beautiful voice, they're Anthony Hopkins who talks about Wales but is fundamentally an American person mm. and, and really uh, and ironically they're all from Port Albert as well um, and really there's, there's nobody else so there's those people, there's some Welsh bands and then there's sports people and really you know, Wales is much more than that. And also, where are the women? Where are they? Who are the Welsh women? Um, you know, there, there's some old sisters who live in Llangochen and um, and used to collect art. That's who Welsh women are. And, and women in stovepipe hats. And there are some amazing Welsh academics, Margaret John and uh, Deirdre Beddow. I'm sorry, I was just looking at my bookshelf there, and Deirdre Beddow. Mm -hmm. But they're not really celebrated as much as the Welsh men are. So, yeah, so that's my sort of I, I do have quite a love hate relationship with Wales. I haven't always been here and I 
I don't always feel comfortable here either. I think it's a really fascinating dimension, you know, which I, I know we'll continue to explore over the course of our conversation for probably many years to come. And that's about this sort of this idea of uh, the, even the gender formation or the gendered formation of a national identity. I, I'm really interested, actually. I mean, it sounds like fundamentally, you know, we've got two different reference points, you know, being a man and being a woman growing up in Wales. Uh, now, for, from what you're saying here, it sounds like I, I can't help but imagine it was quite alienating, you know, being brought up, especially in Port Talbot, where there's a concentration of, of Welsh talent, of Welsh exports, um, of such an, in, you know, industrial backdrop. It's a very masculine place. It's very hard. It's very grey. It's very almost unemotional at times. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm broadly canvassing here. I know Port Talbot quite well. I worked there for many years. Um, I'm really interested in when your... I guess, relationship with Wales uh, academically sort of began. I mean, so, you know, you brought up in uh, in Port Talbot. You mentioned that you felt, you know, quite alienated or at least left out of the sort of the conversation of, or, you know, the, left out of this, uh, uh, the development of the Welsh character then. Uh, when, when in life did that sort of, when was that moment where you thought, you know, I, I need to sort of go back, I need to really interrogate this, I really need to, you know, Form a new ground zero, I guess, for these formations of of, of gendered Welshness. Um, um, I guess it hasn't been very long, but I guess it's always been in my unconscious mind. Um, one of the things I've realised over the past ten, maybe fifteen years, is how oppressed I felt as a woman. I've, I've known that in general, but also increasingly having lived in Cardiff for 20 years one of the things I find interesting is that um, there's a lot of attempts to oppress women on the street maybe sometimes occasionally at work maybe in um, social media and in things like representation in popular culture and in general I feel um, so while I've always felt fairly oppressed, growing up in Port Talbot was really difficult. And I've written about this. I did a I was at a steelworks conference in July um, and it was a Twitter conference and um, uh, everybody was talking in the steelworks conference about steelworks, funnily enough. Um, and there are lots of people talking about heritage and identity, uh, very little on women. Um, there was some really lovely uh, work that people are doing, though, on women who worked in steelworks as steelworkers and generations of women. But there was no real, um, apart from me, I, I really wanted to talk about growing up in um, a steel town. And I didn't think anybody would be really interested in it either. And so I did this sort of cathartic abstract where I sent it over um, to the uh, organisers thinking, you know, I won't I won't hear anything really because it's not really um, anything to do with what they're talking about. Really, they're talking about steelworks and and masculine and, and they're not talking about masculinity, but it's implicit in what they're doing is that they're talking about masculinity. So I thought, oh, well, you know, nobody would be particularly interested. Immediately I had a response back saying, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we want that. And I was like, oh, OK. And then I realised, though, I was really putting my heart on my sleeve by saying the things I was going to say because it was really honest. Um, and it was very, I realised it was quite painful. Um, I said lots of things. I had a really poor education. I um, I was very maligned. Um, I went to art college, like, you know, why would you do that? And, and edu you know, it's really interesting, Mike, you and I have talked about education. Education is, I think, highly problematic for Welsh people. They desire it, but they don't like it. Again, there's this lovely paradox and sort of schism between people who are educated and people who aren't. Uh, some, I've, I was very much brought up in a place where inverted snobbery was really the thing. And also, you know, as I'm speaking, I'm very aware that these are my experiences. They're not other people's experiences. My, even like people sitting next to me in in school would have been very different to mine and, and that's absolutely fine but also what I have found in after the Twitter conference was that I had quite a few people get in touch with me and say 
oh yeah I I, re I totally recognize what you say and I can't believe you've actually said it because this is how I felt and it was really um it felt really meaningful to be honest I, I haven't written that up as a paper but it's my plan after I've written this damned book proposal mm -hmm. it's it, it's the thing it's the next thing that I'm working on which is to send off uh is is to write the paper which is an auto auto autoethnographic account of growing up in Port Albert in the 80s where it was really hard there was nothing to do the steelworks lurked inexorably in front of you you heard it you could smell it um it was there in the dark it was there in the light um it, it was really difficult there was nothing to do um you kind of kept your head down and tried not to be noticed and I've spoken to other Welsh people who've said that as well that there were a lot of in school particularly there were a lot of factions and, and sort of subcultures and if you were in them you, that was great but if if you weren't in them you, you know you were quite maligned and and I've got a colleague who says the same about grow, growing up in Newport he kept his head down a lot because um he said that was just quite the best thing to do so again you know this sort of identity the sort of schism between men and women but also in terms of the lack of women is the thing that I think I'm probably the most interested in. Where are the Welsh women? Who are they? It's really interesting after I gave the um, the sort of Twitter pres uh, conference presentation, somebody um, got in touch with me and said, oh, that's basically the best thing I've ever read on Twitter. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's really nice of you to say. And she she copied Michael Sheen in. She went, Michael Sheen, have you seen this? This is one of the people from your hometown. And in quite a sort of, you know, it's like the angry manner. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, hi. I, I, you know, I don't know you, Michael Sheen. And Michael Sheen said, well, you know, yes, that was very interesting. It was very interesting. And of course, women do play a very good part, often in a supportive role. And I said, yeah, but, you know, what if you don't want to be a supportive woman? What if you want to be the person who wants to be doing the things? You know, actually, it's still the same. Very little has changed in Port Albert. It's a bit nicer. I'm not like, you know, I'm not I'm not doing the place down at all, but it's it's a much nicer place to live because my friends still live there and I go and see them it and it feels much nicer but it's not brilliant it's not fantastically wonderful it hasn't all the money you know where's the money gone to sort of make it nicer the beachfront is fantastic now compared to the way it was when we were younger I mean there are actual cafes that sell food this is a phenomenon I think you know but yeah it, it, it's it's interesting, but it you know not 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 that much has changed really. I'm I'm really I'm really I'm really I want I want to take this idea further I guess about the sort of the, the, I guess the ghosts of the past um, and in in regard in specifically interrogating this idea of heritage. Um, now it seems that in so first of all you know to, to sort of uh, work off what you were just saying there it seems that often. Sort of Welsh thinkers, it takes leave in the place to to um, understand or begin to process your relationship with it. And you know this is true across sort of cultural writing, but I find it especially a sort of a prominent theme in um, in Welsh literature. Um, so like uh, once again, I'm going to quote a load of men back at you, unfortunately. But um, uh, you know someone like say Raymond Williams in Border Country, it takes this sort of young Welsh scholar from the valleys who's working in a sort of prestigious university in England, uh, who has to go home to sort of uh, tend, tend to his father's last days. And, you know, he gets this, so it takes him being away from sort of Wales to start to begin to process his relationship with Welshness. When he returns to Wales, there's a sense of immediate sort of alienation that he's felt growing up. Uh, and it seems from our conversation, you know, that's that's very much still a thing. Um, and I guess, I guess, I guess, it kind of leads to the second question I really wanted to sort of uh, explore today is what role does heritage play in identity formation? Now, you talked about the sort of the industrial landscape that sort of loomed over your upbringing. You've talked a little about this, about the society there. Um, and I guess with with Port Talbot, it's quite interesting uh, in that that heritage is still visible. It's still operational. Um, and now I'd like to just, uh, you know, take a mo few moments just to sort of provide maybe a point of comparison. So, I mean, I come from a town called Traharis, which is in Merthyr Tydfil. Um, now it's a sort of 
a deep sort of deep mine, a, a, a mining town, you know, it's steeped in a sort of mining history, a coal mining history with a deep navigation um, column, um, which I kind of vaguely remember growing up. Um, now I was about six or seven when they when they closed it um, and when that colliery was shut down. Um, and I guess it was quite interesting. I, I think it's probably there maybe on a subconscious level that, you know, my sort of existential relationship with identity maybe began um, when this sort of this token of heritage, this reminder of an industrial culture, uh, this reminder of that one thing that united us all in this sort of small community, but a community that's very much emblematic of a South Walian sort of community, the mine in town. Um, so, you know, when, when this, when the, when the, when the colliery was collapsed and I guess we were left with this, this idea of this sort of like mythic communal sort of spirit that was kind of barely clinging on, I guess, after the sort of Thatcher premiership. Um, and I, I guess, you know, thinking back on some of the themes and maybe some of the, the parallels as well as differences in our sort of upbringing is that maybe the, this physical reminders, the tangible heritage, uh, as well as then the intangible heritage, those sort of communal feels. I guess, I mean, so to return to that question, you know, what, what role does heritage play in identity formation, do you think? And specifically in terms of Welsh identity or Welsh identities, because I think, you know, we need to sort of increasingly pluralise these ideas of, of mm -hmm. identity. And, and I know your, your, your scholarship is a very much a drive to do that, to open up the conversation, to open up the definition of identity. I, I think fundamentally there is a what I would see is an over-reliance on nostalgia, a sense of particularly in terms of heritage. It and 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 it sort of brings me back to the idea of hardness, really. One one of the things that I I think about all the time is the way in which Welsh men are always represented as being hard, as in they are hard drinkers, they're hard workers, and they play hard. So they work hard, they play hard. It was the um, one of the, uh, the headmaster of my secondary school used to say that. He, he used to say, no, come on, we all have to work hard and play hard. And, and I remember thinking, I don't really understand that. I don't really understand what he means. What does playing hard mean? And what he meant was um, he was referring to rugby. He was referring to playing hard at rugby and being good at, at sport and also working hard at your sort of studies. But it never, ever spoke to me. And I always found it a really confusing thing. But what my fundamental feeling on heritage is that it's about nostalgia. It's about a time that most people won't remember. Um, and it, one of the things I find really interesting about meeting you is that I, I'm twice your age and yet our experiences are really similar, <laughs> although we grew up in different places, um, at, certainly at very different times. It's very similar. Um, so one of the things that I think in terms of heritage is how nostalgic people are for a, a time of masculinity that was deemed really important, when literally men went and endangered themselves every day, particularly in, in the mines. I mean, it was an absolute horrendous job. Um, uh, and, you know, nobody would, um, this idea that you would want to do that, uh, but you had to do that. And actually you did that and you felt proud. And not only did you, so pride is a really important thing in Wales as well. This sense of pride that you went down the pit and you physically removed something that kept the country running. There's this love, there's this lovely sort of um, connection, I think. And, and when that, when that was removed, because it was deemed not not important anymore, a lot of the things that came with it were absolutely squashed. And, and I, I, I don't know, but I feel like I can sort of relate to that rather. In working, living in an industrial town like Port Talbot was different, though, from that. The job was, the jo in some parts of the steelworks, it was no less dangerous. And sometimes, as somebody who lived there, the bangs and the crashes, the pauses, and then the inevitable sound of the fire engines, the police and the ambulance. My parents lived on a main road and the 
you know, you would see convoys of these things dashing past the house to get to the steelworks because clearly there had been some horrendous accident and clearly people had been, you know, some people died. So, but in terms of heritage, what I see is a nostalgia for the danger and, and, and the relationship between danger and masculinity, I think it, it, it is symbiotic. And this idea that what makes Welsh men Welsh is this sense of hardness and pride. And in that, women are entirely absent. Women are at home waiting for the phone call. Women are, you know, there are images of women filling tin baths of of hot water for the miners. You know, I know there are pit head, there were pit head baths and various things, but you know, there's this very this sense of nostalgia of looking after our men, um, you know, and yeah, it's uh, and we were talking the other day, weren't we, about. Um, it's what also it's really interesting you were talking about Thatcher immediately. Um, I can't watch The Crown at the moment, this series, the television programme, The Crown, because it has Thatcher in it. And um I thought, oh, I, I, I just can't. I can't watch it. And also I, I tweeted the other day something about um, I can't watch it because uh, my mother, who died a couple of years ago, would literally come back and haunt me because she hated Thatcher so much. She literally Thatcher would come on the telly and she was always on the telly in the 80s. And my mum would shout, that bloody woman, and fly across the room to switch her off. She wouldn't have her in the house, mm. you know. Um, and the hatred, the absolute hatred of um, Margaret Thatcher. And she's not a woman and she doesn't care about Welsh people. And just it was so rife, particularly with my mum, though. My mum was such a fervent hater of her and, and we've all it's really interesting looking at the crown as well we've talked about this sort of our um episode of our van which is just so egregious and so terrible um and, and really the representation of wales there you know of of people scrabbling around on on a sort of slag heap and that being work, that people living very close together in tiny houses, you know, and community being what there is. Um, and there's no sense of estrangement or dislike for outsiders. There's always sort of good camaraderie, you know, the sense that, you know, it, it wasn't always like that. You know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of bitchiness and unpleasantness as well, you know, and people perhaps blanking other families for various reasons you know so it's not it wasn't all sort of uh, what did people say bread and roses and community <laughs> and you know like in the in the fantastic I have to say in the fantastic film Pride I'm just bringing out all the popular culture references now but the, fa oh, the fantastic God. film Pride where everybody sort of got up and sang which is all really lovely uh, and of, indeed the community is fantastic but you know not all communities were like that because not not everywhere did industry breed a community, you know, that was tight and close knit and good and positive, you know. That, that's my take on it. I, 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 I know in the, in the second part of this conversation, we're going to sort of interrogate the screen a little further. But do you think there's the potential with programmes such as The Crown or Pride? Um, I, I, sorry, I'll, I'll reapproach this uh, sort of anecdotally. So, like, my, my father is currently re uh, watching the fourth season of, of The Crown, and, uh, you know, he very much shares the sort of sentiments of, of, of your late mother there. Um, you know, very much a sort of uh, a venomous hatred of of, um, of Margaret Thatcher. But it's quite interesting. After he viewed uh, a recent episode, he, he texted me. Um, no, he texted me, and my dad... You know, he very much conforms to this idea of the sort of the, the stoic Welsh male. You know, he's very guarded with his emotions. Uh, but he sends me one of the, you know, and we, we, we share this stream. Uh, it's an intensely sort of emotional stream where he's he's using the platform. He's using, first of all, the, the crown has triggered something inside him. Then he's using the platform of text messaging with me to to talk about like a friend he lost at a, at a protest outside Wapping in London, uh, where at three in the morning they were trampled by horses, you know, uh, totally unannounced. There was a, a retaliation against the, the protesters, a retaliation against, you know, the, the, the free speech. Um, 
and they were trampled and you know his friend was lost um, and similarly then that led to a conversation about the collapse of industry and the suicide of his cousin uh, another man who was you know kind of just disenfranchised i guess by the sort of politics of thatcher and overall i mean our text conversation had a death toll of maybe you know five or six of his close male friends or family members so whilst you know i i I mean, certainly, you know, I haven't experienced that. I'm sort of born into that, I guess, born into the aftermath of it. Um, but it's interesting to see the potential of, of drama to maybe start that conversation. And, and for my father to it almost unlocks this emotional dimension of his character. And secondly, with, with, with something like Pride, it was very interesting. Yeah, you know, you talk about these ideas of sort of, of spontaneous song and sort of the death of the communal attachments. And as much as I sort of resist those, it's weird because when I go back home, I, I usually end up singing after a few ales with with my with with a load of, of Welshmen in a in a in a in a, in a, in a labour club. Which, you know, it's uh, as as much as I resist these these ideas. Fundamentally, for those few hours, you know, whether generationally, politically divided uh, and detached, I feel from from that community. For those moments, we are united by. A history or, or shared song so it's really interesting and it's a really tense relationship i have with it as well and a very self-critical relationship but one i fu fundamentally always sort of get sucked into i guess so but i know we're going to take that a little further when we when we discuss the screen um so i think we'll end part one there and then uh, we'll, we'll take a little break and then we'll we'll return to to discuss uh television and film okay i'm going to stop the recording now Okay, so welcome back to part two. Uh, now, with this second part of the conversation, I'm really interested to hear sort of Ashley's thoughts on depictions of Wales and Welsh identity on screen. Um, so I've got a few questions about sort of film and TV depictions and our sort of relationship with them. Uh, the first place to start then is a general sort of question. How is Wales and Welshness typically depicted on screen, in your opinion? Highly, highly stereotypical. Again, mainly men. Um, and uh, one of the things I find, it, and by stereotypical, I mean, OK, this is what I mean. I mean, really, really uneducated, not very bright, actually, figure of fun. Things like always, always white, always working class always heterosexual, the only gay in the village. Uh, I mean, so sort of heteronormative as well, that um, the only gay in the village is a term of, of amusement. Um, a bit creepy, like Uncle Bryn from uh, Gavin and Stacey. So, uh, and also in things like Pride, you know, totally up for helping each other and not being unpleasant. Um, and there are things like in... Um, W1A, for example, uh, the Welsh woman saying, um, Monica Dolan is, um, I think she's of Irish extraction, but she's playing a Welsh woman, which I think is really interesting, considering that there are lots of female Welsh actors around. But her, her saying was, I'm not being funny, but, and, and, and she would start every conversation with, I'm not being funny, right? And so immediately it was, well, you are being funny and, and you know, there you are surrounded by lots of um, well-spoken English people, which makes you sound even more stupid. So this this really interesting stereotype of people who are not very bright, sport crazy, maybe a little bit on the alcoholic side or or just weird, like like some of the characters in Gavin and Stacey, so a yeah. bit weird, bit creepy. Um, yeah, that, that's my perspective anyway. I know it's certainly one I share and a, a question I want to come back to later is thinking about the sort of damage of these or the sort of repercussions of these representations on screen, not only for Welsh people, but for people hoping to understand the Welsh character on screen, whether you know they're from Wales or not. Um, a question I'd like to immediately sort of ask then is, when did you first become aware of these stereotypes so when, when were you first sort of activated I guess thinking about you know Wales and Welshness on screen is there a certain example of um, film or tv that you could uh, sh share with us? I think it was Satellite City the Welsh program written by Boyd Clack 
who is um, he's a general actor. I think he's been in Pirates of the Caribbean and things like that. And I've actually seen him in Cardiff because, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. Like, you know, you step out of your door and you see literally everybody's an actor or a musician in Cardiff or they present the telly or the sport, you know. Um, so um, and one thing I remember, I think I, I I don't know how I saw it when I was coming coming home from university, maybe. And I saw Satellite City and it was really interesting to me the way in which the characters were represented as being intelligent losers. So they're all on benefits. They're all on pills for their nerves. The wife, particularly the um, there's a Canadian character called Randy, who sort of I think he serves to sort of as a sort of as a foil for the Welsh people and to sort of either point things out to them or to, I don't know, if he reminds them of how small they are. They don't go out to the village. They don't go to Cardiff because it'll boil your head. Um, and it, it's sort of very small town and everybody knows each other. And I just I remember really, really enjoying it, though, because it was so funny. And the reason it was funny was because people it, because it was so sort of small worldish, and I remember the the grandfather asking Randy. He said, "Hey, Randy, you're a man of the world, aren't you? What is scampy?" And I just remember thinking that was hilarious. But also, it's like you're a man of the world, so you must know what scampy is. And and it was amusing, and the characters are great, but they are a bit. You know, there's, there's one of the characters, she's talking about um, the Ballad of Red and Goal, and she calls it the Ballad of Red and Goal, man. And it's like, no, no, it's Red in Jail. And, and the, the male character is 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 like the intelligent one, but he's sort of, he's never found his metier, he's never left Wales, you know, he was a bit bookish. Um, so he comes out with sort of this sort of ex existential philosophy about being Welsh. But, you know, he still knows the difference between jail and goal. Um, and, and, and the person's insisting, no, no, it's red in goal. Goal, it says, look, goal. Y you know, so this idea that Welsh people aren't very bright, actually, is a continuing stereotype as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, to, to my earliest sort of conscious examples, uh, I mean, of course, there's, 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 there's Fireman Sam, but satellite city is the... <gasps> <laughs> Satellite City is the first one that you know is one I was brought up with in my sort of young teens. Uh, it's one that you know I I, I did find funny and I, I still do find funny if I see clips and I, every year when I teach this module I show clips from Satellite City. Um, but it's interesting that my relationship with that stereotype was really triggered with Not in Hill with the character of Spike and it's for the very same reasons. Then um, there's the sort of the downplaying of intelligence. Um, they usually contextualize with an with another. So in Satellite City, you had the Canadian character. No, the only function of, of Spike in Notting Hill is there to really reinforce a sort of exportable sense of Englishness, the Englishness of Hugh Grant of Notting Hill uh, as a as a predominantly white um, white English, you know, um, middle class community. When, as we know, Notting Hill that's not the demographic of Notting Hill. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, just to share experiences, I guess, it's very much the same satellite city, um, but also uh, the spike in Norton Hill. And I guess over the years, you know, as I've sort of, you know, I've taught um, uh, film studies, you know, I've, I've looked at sort of uh, neo-colonial, uh, post-colonial sort of literature, and it's really interesting to identify some of the reasons there. And I guess I'd like to think about this idea of, of performativity. Um, now, Stemming from some of this literature, uh, I've sort of identified um, a number of quotes that talk about how how the oppressed then play to an expectation. They play for the master. They play for uh, a ruling culture. And it's interesting how we as a culture have sort of happily gone along with those stereotypes, have performed them. It's almost the expectation. And there's a recent sitcom called The Tuckers, and it's pretty much a carbon copy of something like Satellite City. It's about a family who are on benefits, living in South Wales, playing into those exact same stereotypes. And it's almost like they're playing for an outside audience that has a sort of external expectation 
of how how we should behave and it's really interesting how that sort of tension when you I mean I start only started my journey with the scholarship around this theme of you know the oppressed of the oppressed of performing of performing you know uh, these expectations and it's interesting to I've been able to locate them in some severely instances of Welsh poetry and R.S. Thomas is one that we use every year whose poetry a peasant was very much a sort of a protest it was telling the Welsh people to wake up you know stop performing this this pastoral idiot this man this feral man of the world you know inside you there's an intellectual there's a there's a person who's breaking from this heritage who has a conflicted relationship with identity I'm yet to see it really on screen um so it's really yeah. really interesting to hear the parallels there yeah, and do and, you know the other thing, uh, Mike, that I was just thinking of as you were talking, the other thing which was really meaningful to me was Rob Bryden, again from Port Talbot. Um, Rob Bryden, the Welsh comedian, did a, um, did a programme, I think 2008, called um, Searching for the Welsh Identity. It, it's like, what is it that makes people Welsh? OK, and I always remember in that and I think in, in he was being interviewed he says um Welsh people you know they're really interested they're so different from other Celtic people uh, Celtic people so what he says is um you know you've got uh, uh I can't remember the name of the film now some Scottish film with Mel Gibson in uh, a Brave kilt Hearts. Brave Brave Hearts. Hearts. you got Braveheart and, you know, Braveheart says, uh, you can take our land, but you can never take our freedom. Right. And and, and then he says, because in Wales, it's uh, you can take our land and make sure you take your freedom on the way out as well. OK, this sort of this mm. sort of complicit oppression, this, this as you said, this sort of um, people who are also engaged in the oppression is is really interesting. And I, I have a clip of that. I will add to um, Ruth Jones, but he's like, you know, but Welsh people, they are oppressed, you know, they're always oppressed. And she just turns to him and says, but when, Rob? Hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years ago. And, and he's like, well, you know, and she's like, but not, you know, not now. And then she sort of walks away and, and you think, mm. and, and yet, you know, look at the discourse around the pandemic of people trying to get into Wales to go on holiday. I mean, we can talk about that later when we talk about the um, uh, Wales and, and sort of how other people see it and what, you know, what they see rather than what there is. Uh, we can perhaps talk about that a bit. Absolutely. Um, I, I guess that sort of, that really sort of sets up the sort of next um, point that I wanted to talk about, is, which is of, um, Wales as a location. Now, um, one thing I've sort of mentioned to you is that, as I've mentioned to sort of others is, and I tried to sort of launch a book on this, um, which is Wales as a film location. Increasingly, we're seeing it, its presence on screen. You know, it's recently in um, His Dark Materials. It's in The Watchmen. It's in HBO show Industry. HBO seems to be filming a lot in Wales at the moment. Um, in all of those texts, and in Sherlock, of course, but in all of these texts, Wales is absent. It's it's absent only for those perhaps who don't know Wales and who don't know Cardiff in particular. Um, it's funny when I when I watch Sherlock or his dark materials, I'm like, there's that corner in 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 Penarth. There is oh, that's just outside the the civic centre in the middle of Cardiff. That's not London. Um, that's not um, you know, that's not where Sherlock lives. That's uh, the street around the corner, which is uh, Wombabee Street or something. You know, so. So fundamentally, for me, it, it disengages me in these sort of fictional narrative spaces on screen. But what it's got me thinking about is the is very much the absence of Wales and Welshness. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like it's hidden in plain sight. Um, I mean, would you like to sort of talk about that a little further? Um, perhaps, or? Um, yeah, um, one of the things that uh, as you were talking pre uh, when we were having our conversation just now about um, how Welsh people are a figure of fun and various things and is in, in my research I've come across the concept of internal colonization which is when it is what it says it is when one group of people oppress another group particularly around their culture 
and their language. Um, one of the one of the things that I found really interesting in the past 10 years is how there have been many more popular Welsh language programmes like Hinterland and Hidden, particularly. And I sometimes get texts from friends who live in London saying that Welsh, uh, that Welsh, uh, that Welsh detective series is good, isn't it? And I'm like, which one? And they say and I'm like, yeah, it's OK. It's you know, we have discussion about it. Um, but I again, I, I find it quite difficult to think about. Yeah, as, as you say, Wales is not very important in terms of its Welshness in other things, in other things that are filmed there. It's really interesting you say about filming and seeing things you recognise. Literally, his dark materials is filmed around the corner from my house and I ran through the film set last year and I literally, last week, something was being literally filmed again in round the corner from my house and I ran through another film set. I'm running through film sets all the time. Yeah. Um, and I remember Doctor Who, you know, running past... Um, David Tennant's caravan because they were because they were in the way as well, which is really interesting. Um, that's one of the things I found. And also I, Doctor Who's been filmed at the place of my work. And I remember walking down from my office one day, looking around, thinking, oh, I just need to buy a pint of milk. And there was some bloke standing o opposite me and I walked towards him and then he went cut. And I was like, what's going on? I, I peer over the banisters to see Pearl Mackey and um, the guy from um, Little Britain filming something. And I'm like, oh, OK, I'm in the middle of a film set again. Uh, mm. But I there is no representation of Wales at all. Uh, sometimes there are Welsh actors in there. And it's really interesting. You just um, you, you talked about Spike in Notting Hill. I always forget him for some reason. I always forget him. Uh, but I, I don't, and I only really know about him in Twin Town really yeah, yeah. which is another film which is again about welsh people trying to get away with something not being well educated they're trying to get away with things they're trying to mm. you know they're a bit criminal they're a bit whatever a bit weird mm. so yeah i mean the stereotypes i think are, are really i think they're really problematic but also the saying now that um wales is very much a playground this idea that it's a it, it's a lovely place to visit. Apparently, the beaches are nice. Uh, people can you can go walking in the hills. Lots of people own second homes here um, in Wales. I mean, rather than w where I am. But uh, and in the pandemic, that caused lots of problems with people coming to Wales. And then there was a lot of friction, particularly on Twitter with English people saying, we pay your money for you, and, and Welsh people saying, you're not welcome. And, and this really sort of ten, tension. The pandemic is really interesting. It's brought about uh, this sort of absence of knowledge around Wales as somewhere that people go for enjoyment and pleasure. And also, I have to say, I remember when I was a child, I couldn't get my head around the fact that people came on Wales for holiday. <laughs> I literally... Because I just wanted to leave. I didn't, I was like, well, people come here. Why would you come here? What for? You know, <laughs> and, you know, that was, you know, I hadn't seen a reservoir perhaps or a nice, <laughs> uh, I hadn't walked up a, a, a jolly hill at that point. So I didn't quite understand. But, but you know, tourism in Wales is a massive, massive area, of course, which is interesting given the things that are filmed here and how absent they are. Because yeah. I think I think there is in in some of the tourist boards. There used to be a tourist board. No, I don't. I don't think it's called that now. But um, the I, I think it's like come you know come and see where such and such was filmed. And you're like, well, you know, when you go there, it's very different. Actually, I remember going to the pub that they was in Sherlock um, yeah. in the Vale of Glamorgan, and it's look, of course. It is the mm -hmm. pub, but it looks completely different as well, inside and out. Mm. So on the one hand, you know, Wales is a, is probably a nice place to film. And indeed, there are a lot, you know, literally, I can't leave my house without stepping on some film crew or other. But also the extent to which Wales gets amalgamated in that or promoted through it is extremely limited, it seems. Yeah, I think I'd like 
of like maybe refine what you're saying there on in regard to sort of tourism and thinking specifically about like film induced tourism um so in, in terms of the first of all i thinking about like recent shows that have shot there it's interesting to see that wales is sort of being sort of used and exploited as an asset um so i mean you can undertake the the doctor who experience in london you can go to oxford and have his dark materials walking tour but fundamentally you're walking through a replica of oxford a replica of london that was recreated in cardiff it's interesting in cardiff we're revisiting the sites of sherlock which are a, an approximation of itself in london or it's a, you know a site in uh, a site in london so it's really interesting we get cardiff perform in london then Cardiff advertising tours for basically a simulacra of London, which is fascinating, I think. And likewise, in in this sort of other territories, in 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 Oxford and 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 in London especially, you know, they effectively sell in an experience of those sites, but recreated in Cardiff. But fundamentally, Wales is not part of that conversation. And it's interesting, I guess, you know, we we're, we're kind of circling ideas of sort of exploitation here. And I mean, if we think about it in economic terms we're generating income for the United Kingdom, but we're not really benefiting much in terms of the figures through uh, film-induced tourism, because places like Oxford, places like London are capitalizing on, you know, the, uh, a platform for those places that was fundamentally created in, in, in Wales. Um, that's really fascinating. Um, do you think, Wales and Welsh culture has a, have a future on screen beyond beyond the stereotype. I guess have you seen instances where the stereotype has they've gone beyond that, and I'm struggling to find in, in my own in my own mind right now. But well, do you think there's potential? And it's interesting you should say that because I had somebody from a television production company contact. Have I told you this? Have I told you about the person no, from the no, television no. production company? Okay. So I, I gave a paper at a conference a couple of weeks ago on Welsh masculinity. And then a couple of weeks later, I had an email from somebody from a television production company saying, really enjoyed your paper, which is really nice of her. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get together ideas for a Welsh pr a programme about Wales that isn't typical, that doesn't have Hugh Edwards presenting it in you know no disrespect to Hugh Edwards absolutely no, 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 no. you know but he's buying jam in Carmarthenshire and and talking about Wales and and you know looking over the bucolic hills and um so I literally went into manic Welsh mode about various things and um and I told about my research and 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 about how women are entirely lacking from literally anything to do with Wales at all and he, and if they are it's Cardiff based which is something and I know um a uh, I noticed that a parent at my school whom I don't know has presented a television program her name is Adiola Dewis and she did some she's a, a filmmaker and um she's interested in performing arts and performance um and she did a couple of films um, last year about um, black women in Wales um, and how they got to be here and why they're here and what their heritage is. And it was a brilliant film because there you had a black woman interviewing another black woman talking about being Welsh. It was really fabulous and really watchable. And in Wales as well, there's been a Recently, there has been a television series on black miners. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of that. I think it was yeah, a BBC yeah. production. Um, black but Month, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's a shame it's part of Black History Month and it's is history every day, yeah. uh, of course. Um, but I think at least there was an attempt to address the issue. But of course, it was still men. Mm -hmm. Whereas what Adiola has done is look at looked at women's experiences, which I think is really important because women's experiences are entirely, almost entirely absent from discourse on Wel Welshness in any, you know, in any form at all, really. Um, so I, I'm vaguely hopeful. 
<laughs> I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to do my work and trying to get myself out there. Um, I I was also I've got a friend who's a, a script writer and I was telling her um, she was saying about how she's not Welsh. Uh, she lives in Cardiff. She said how hard it is to pitch ideas around for programmes with Welsh people that isn't literally about stereotypes of people on the dole and um, or or playing sport or something. She said it was all about rugby, drinking and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fiddling benefits or something egregious like that, you know. So rather than anybody, you know, um, one of the things I find really interesting is, is how Welsh educated people perhaps are absent or that there's a gap between them. So you've got you've got lovely Hugh Edwards there, you know, with his lovely voice and his overcoat overlooking a beautiful valley or or a viaduct or something nice, you know. Um and he's clearly a sort of educated man and and, and various things. And and then and then you've got Welsh blokes getting drunk over the rugby and having a big wreck on a Saturday night. And there's literally nothing in between. There are no black guys, there are no gay guys, mm. that that, you know, uh, and certainly women are are almost entirely absent. So I would like to think, you know, people like Adiola are brilliant and are making a difference, but it's really slow. It's really, really slow. And I think people are ready now. I mean, you and I certainly are, are ready for something a bit more than a stereotype, you know? Yeah. But even yeah. the, you know, that's why I think Hidden, Hidden is such a good, it's a great programme, but it's about women who are mourning the loss of men mm -hmm. quite a lot. So the characters, the, the main main characters are all sort of in the first series, they were all sort of helping the dad who was dying. And then the second series, the dad has died, I think. And so they're all sort of learning to live with each other. So, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not as successful as they might be. You know, I think one of them's got divorced. Yeah, you know, that sort of this idea that it's all very that w the women as well, they can't just be very ordinary women. Yeah. It, it fascinates me, you know, and it, it troubles me in equal measure because, I mean, firstly, uh, you know, finding a sort of point of reference growing up, I guess, as a, I, I wasn't a young intellectual, you know, by any stretch, I'm an average grader. Um, but as I've sort of developed into this sort of academic position, Finding finding a visible role model is very very difficult, uh, especially on screen. I found it. I've managed to find traces in literature. And secondly, I guess what troubles me is, you know, I wonder why that why there is this lack of narrative. You know, you know, being brought up in these communities where you know predominantly fathers worked, especially I can only speak for my community, but, um, you know, I was. I was brought up with, you know, with women. I was brought up with my sisters, my mother, both my nans, you know, worked in the in the in the local factories. You know, they were very industrious in nature. They were very independent. I mean, I, I could probably, you know, write dozens of narratives that aren't that typical narrative. And secondly, you know, we're I guess we're, we're the sort of, you know, the, 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 the Welsh um, women iconic characters. You know, we, we know we've got we have got. You know, many, you know, we got uh, Rose Crochet.